Good afternoon. I hope everyone's enjoying what I'm sure has been a fantastic day. The task I have set for myself is to take you on a trip through time. It seems like the right time to do this because by taking the opportunity to look back can help us to decide how best to move forward. Now, when we look at some of the ongoing challenges, it's sometimes hard to believe that much has changed, but it has. So why should we expect that evidence-based reading instruction would be used in schools? The rigorous research literature, which is now known as the science of reading, to which our eminent keynote speaker, Professor Airy, has been a major contributor, it has been building for half a century at least. Yakov Pesha and colleagues found that 14,000 studies on reading had been published in the previous decade. Now that's just the tip of the iceberg. Luckily, there are a number of excellent reviews of this research that are all freely available. There is no good reason for this evidence to be ignored. Efforts to bring the scientific reading research about effective instruction into classrooms has been going on for much more than two decades. But I'm just going to take you back uh, as far as 2002, when some of you might have still been at school. In 2002, a parliamentary inquiry into the declining educational achievement of boys produced a report in which various explanations were discussed. One of the key factors was proposed to be the method of early reading instruction and particularly the lack of systematic and explicit teaching of phonics. The report drew extensively on research conducted by the then relatively new multi-lit reading program and the gains made by boys who had, had intensive remedial instruction. These are just two of the recommendations in the report relating to reading instruction and intervention. The committee recommends that Commonwealth funded literacy programs should be required to adopt an integrated approach which includes a strong element of explicit, intensive systematic phonics instruction. The committee recommends that Commonwealth, state and territory education authorities ensure that teacher education places much greater emphasis on the pedagogy of teaching literacy and numeracy. Further, pre-service training in teaching literacy should involve an integrated approach which includes explicit, intensive, structured phonics as an essential element in early and remedial literacy instruction. This was 20 years ago, but one of the members of that parliamentary committee was none other than our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. Let's hope he has a long memory, or perhaps a little reminder is in order. In 2004, a group of 26 eminent reading researchers, linguists, educational psychologists and cognitive scientists wrote an open letter to then Federal Education Minister Brendan Nelson, which was later published in the Australian newspaper. In that letter, it said, we would like particularly to draw your attention to the continuing discrepancy between the model of reading development that forms the basis for most of our current school curricula and teaching methods and the model of reading development that is emerging as a result of the research into reading that has been undertaken over the past 20 to 30 years. This letter renewed the debate over reading instruction. Professor Kevin Weldall and Professor Max Coldhart met with Minister Nelson and a national inquiry into the teaching of literacy was announced shortly after. The reports that emanated from the inquiry were very strong. The main report called Teaching Reading has stood the test of time well. Sadly, some of the problems it identified are still present today. But as I'll go into detail and explain later, there has been good progress. In the Roe report, it said, the committee recommends that teachers provide systematic, direct and explicit phonics instruction so that children master the essential alphabetic code breaking skills required for foundational reading proficiency. Equally, that teachers provide an integrated approach to reading that supports the development of oral language, vocabulary, grammar, reading fluency, comp comprehension and the literacies of new technologies. In 2008, Bill Shorten as Parliamentary Secretary for Disabilities and Children's Services convened a working party chaired by Professor Max Coulthart to provide advice on a national agenda to assist people with dyslexia. In 2010, this working party produced a report that found that few of the Roe Report recommendations had been implemented and made 19 recommendations, including these ones. Recommenda recommendation six, evidence-based teaching. 
It should be ensured that appropriate teaching strategies shown through rigorous evidence-based research to be effective in developing strong literacy skills are used in all Australian junior primary classrooms. This will assist in reducing the impact of dyslexia significantly. All schools should ensure that three waves of literacy provision are in place, are of a high quality and are well coordinated. In order to achieve this, schools should have access to the expertise of teachers with specialist skills in addressing dyslexic difficulties. Provision should be made for close monitoring of students at risk of, at risk of dyslexia, as well as those diagnosed with dyslexia. Learning support should be provided for those diagnosed with dyslexia through a learning support plan that incorporates individual literacy teaching, resilience teaching and classroom accommodations. The current Australian curriculum is called version 9, but it's only the third full version to be endorsed for use in schools. The first version of the curriculum was published in 2010, so just a couple of years after that Dyslexia Working Party. And it had a few minor revisions in 2012, but it had barely reached classrooms when it was formally reviewed in 2014, when the revised version published in 2015. The 2015 version of the primary English curriculum was a, a big improvement on the original one and actually reflected finally some of the recommendations of those reviews that had been done. It had much more content related to the teaching of reading that would encourage evidence-based practice. Nevertheless, it retained elements of balanced literacy and whole language approaches, such as the three queuing methods and predictable texts. Where phonics was acknowledged, analytic phonics was promoted through references to using onset and rhyme to read words. A critical change that occurred prior to the recent review was a revision of the def definition of decoding. This might seem insignificant, but the old definition was being used to justify teaching methods that did not privilege decoding for early reading instruction. There are some very important differences between the earlier versions and the current version of the Australian curriculum. I'll only mention reading and spelling accuracy content here, not content related to vocabulary and comprehension, although they have also improved. The 2012 version did not even mention phonics. In 2012, students were expected to learn some letters in the first year of school and were not expected to use grapheme phoneme correspondences to read and spell. In 2022, students are expected to learn all letters and their most common sounds and to use them to read and spell. The references to predictable texts in Foundation and Year One have been removed in 2022 and replaced with authentic texts. This is not my favourite term, I prefer natural language texts or something like that, but the intention is to recognise that some children can read books beyond decodable books in Foundation and Year One. In 2012, students were to be taught letter sound matches, but the multi queuing method was still promoted. In 2022, multi queuing for word reading is gone, and phonic decoding is listed first among the strategies for reading at this level. In the 2012 curriculum, there was very little content related to word reading and spelling, especially in Year 2. In 2022, it's recognised that there is still content to be learned in, in Year 2, especially for spelling. However, by Year 2, decodable text is no longer the expectation, but it is implicit that students who still need it can still use it. I'm not going to make the case that the current version is perfect. However, I would say that it's much better and the most egregious problems have gone. It's also important to remember that the curriculum is not a syllabus and it's not a scope and sequence, it's a blueprint. The ability to add the sort of detail that some of us might have liked was also constrained because one of the objectives of the review was to reduce the amount of content. Now, whether we think that's a good approach or not, that's what ACARA had to do. The literacy learning progression has been through a couple of iterations with the most recent published in 2019. This document adds flesh to the bones of the Australian curriculum. It also gives teachers some guidance around adjusting expectations for students whose reading development doesn't fall into the typical range. Now, this is an example clipped from the phonic knowledge and word recognition section, so you can see how specific it is. Note the use of terminology such as digraphs and phonemes. And note also the reference to decodable but not predictable text. One of the clearest indicators of a change in attitude towards uh, early reading instruction to include systematic 
phonics um, and to acknowledge the importance of decoding is the gradual rollout of the phonics screening check around the country. So since 2016, when the Focus on Phonics report was published by Five from Five, um, there has been a, a gradual adoption um, in a number of states. The first state to pick it up was South Australia uh, and then New South Wales and Tasmania. So it is actually being used in three states. Um, there is a phonics check in Western Australia and Victoria, but it's not the phonics check, and I'll talk about that a bit later. So now just a helicopter view of literacy policy in the states and territories. I'm sure I've missed some things, but these are some highlights, starting with South Australia. The Year One Phonics Check was one of 10 program elements of a newly formed literacy guarantee unit in the South Australian Department of Education. Recognising that the check would only have a positive effect on teaching and learning if teachers knew how to interpret the results and to act on them by improving their instruction, the Literacy Guarantee Unit has been providing excellent professional learning opportunities to teachers, among these other things. In 2019, an online literacy hub was launched to fulfil part of the literacy policy of the previous federal government. This website has information about teaching and learning to read as well as, as webinars. This literacy hub also provides access to teachers for an online portal uh, for the U1 phonics screening check, which was something that was recommended by the U1 Literacy and Numeracy Assessment Advisory Panel in 2017. This platform is a really sophisticated delivery method and it provides uh, instant reports at the student and the class level, as well as some detailed advice to teachers about how to interpret those results and what kind of things they might do in response. It seems to me that this uh, resource is quite underused. Another element of that federal government's literacy policy was a targeted assistance program in which teachers were recruited to, to work with schools to improve their phonics instruction through coaching. Another really strong indicator of, uh, of a shift in attitudes around reading instruction and intervention is that there is no more reading recovery monopoly. In the 1990s and 2000s, reading recovery was the most widely used early intervention in Australia. It was deeply embedded in government and Catholic school systems, especially in New South Wales and Victoria. In 1998, a survey found that 48% of Australian primary schools used reading recovery, but there were big differences between states, with 78% of Victorian schools using the program, compared with only 15% in Western Australia. By 2017, there had been significant decreases in prevalence, down to 19% nationally, but still 38% in New South Wales and 24% in Victoria, while there were virtually none in WA. Five years later, I suspect the number in New South Wales has declined again, but it's still out there and still taking up time and resources that could be used much more effectively. Learning Difficulties Australia has been expressing strong concerns about the effectiveness of reading recovery for a long time. Former LDA President Kevin Weldall produced a study showing that reading recovery was not effective for the students who most needed reading support in the early 1990s and had been vocal about the need for better evidence-based reading interventions. Fast forward 10 years and an article in The Age in 2014 quoted Professor James Chapman, who was in Melbourne speaking at an LDA conference, as saying that reading recovery did not work for children who had dyslexia or were really struggling to read. That was around the time that the Department of Education in Victoria stopped promoting reading recovery through their early years policy. When Louisa Motes was in Australia to accept the LDA Eminent Researcher Award in 2015, she was even more definitive, saying that the program is harmful for many children. This year, the last vestiges of public support for reading recovery by the Victorian Department of Education were removed. Although the department has not specifically funded reading recovery teachers for some time, documents and references to the program had remained on the department website. In June this year, the last couple were removed after repeated requests from Dys Dyslexia Victoria support. In 2016, the New South Wales State Government was compelled to disendorse reading recovery after it had been the only government funded and supported intervention program for close to two decades. An evaluation conducted by the New South Wales Centre for Education Statistics and Evaluation found that students who had done reading recovery in Year 1 had lower reading outcomes in Year 3 than struggling readers who didn't do reading recovery. 
This year, a large study in the US found the same thing. Turns out, Kevin, James and Louise were right. No surprise about that to anyone here. Nonetheless, there are still schools and systems that continue to use reading recovery and promote the idea that it's effective. So there is still work to do on behalf of students whose precious time is being wasted, but progress has definitely been made. Also in New South Wales, in the dark but not so distant past, it was difficult to find well-written and accurate teaching guides on a government website. New South Wales has had its moments. The New South Wales Board of Studies produced some great documents on phonemic awareness and phonics in the early 2000s, but they disappeared without a trace, not long after. Fortunately, these new guides are easily available and are a terrific resource. In 2019, the New South Wales Government commissioned Jeff Masters to review the New South Wales curriculum. While I'm on the record as disagreeing with Jeff on a lot of what he recommended, on the importance of evidence-based early literacy, he is correct. It's worth mentioning that the only citation in his report around reading instruction was the brilliant literature review by Anne Castles, Kathy Russell and Kate Nation, and also having been a, a former president of LDA, called Ending the Reading Wars. The new New South Wales syllabus for teaching literacy, kinder, kindergarten to year two, is a significant departure from previous syllabi, thanks to the leadership of Paul Martin at the New South Wales Education Standards Authority. It's highly detailed re with respect to the content that's expected to be taught in each stage, and the outcomes are ambitious for all children, but realistic for most children. It's informed by the simple view of reading and Scarborough's reading rope, as well as the wider evidence on each of those components, including the big five. As with the Australian curriculum, the purpose of a syllabus is not to prescribe teaching methods, but the outcomes would be pretty difficult to achieve using pedagogies other than explicit instruction. And the teaching advice that accompanies the syllabus, as well as the teaching guide documents I just mentioned, and, and professional learning that goes along with them, all recommend the use of explicit and systematic instruction. And now to Western Australia and Victoria. In May this year, the Western Australian State Government announced a phonics initiative. Details are scarce in the public domain, but under this policy, schools will be able to choose from a relatively short list of programs endorsed by the State Department of Education. Schools will also be required to assess phonics in year one, but schools are able to use an assessment of their choice and they do not have to report the results, just register that they've done it. In September, the Victorian State Government also announced it would be introducing a phonics check, but again, it's not the phonics check. A set of items have been developed to be added to the English online interview. I think we can view these as positive developments in the main. What concerns me about the approach to the phonics check in WA and Victoria is that the assessments may not be as good as the year one phonics check that has been in use in England since 2012, and is now used in other states in Australia. I know how much technical expertise went into creating the Year One Phonics Check that was developed in the UK, and it's been shown to be significantly predictive of later reading achievement. These unknown assessments may not have the same value, and when you add in that they're to be done at the start of Year One rather than later in the year, the amount of content that they can assess is substantially less and therefore may not provide the information needed about reading progress at that critical time. In 2020, the Catholic education system in Canberra Goulburn Archdiocese embarked on an ambitious project of reform driven by Executive Director Ross Fox, working with the Knowledge Society. The overall project has a number of elements. One is professional learning for all teachers and principals on the evidence-based and high impact teaching practices derived from research that's known as the science of learning. Few, if any, teachers were familiar with concepts like Rosenshine's principles, explicit and direct instruction, cognitive load theory, or a knowledge rich curriculum. And they're certainly not alone among teachers around Australia. In this project, primary schools are required to use explicit and systematic methods of reading instruction. A new framework for assessment was developed using valid and reliable assessment instruments. Canberra Goulburn at Catholic Education is encouraging other dioceses to follow its lead um, and is warmly offering them lots of information and advice. Catholic Education in Tasmania is adopting a similar approach and other dioceses are moving in the same direction. 
The Australian Education Research Organisation, or AERO, was officially established in 2021 with bipartisan support. Its CEO, Jenny Donovan, has long been a champion of evidence-based instruction and has brought that focus to AERO. In its first year, AERO has produced documents on the use of evidence by teachers and by policymakers, as well as practice guides on explicit instruction, classroom management, spaced and interleaving practice, writing instruction, a particularly good one, early literacy and early numeracy. AERO has also partnered with OCA Education to develop and provide access to teaching resources, including sequence lesson plans for years three to 10. 10 years ago, I would have had no faith that a national education organization would be promoting explicit instruction as strongly as AERO does. That AERO is truly evidence-driven has a lot to do with the fact that Jenny's running it, but to some extent also reflects a broader acceptance in the education community. So what about teacher education? Let's go back to 2005. As part of its inquiry, the Rowe Committee looked into initial teacher education. It found that all but three of the 34 institutions devoted less than 10% of total credit points to the teaching of reading, and half of all institutions devoted 5% or less of total credit points to this activity. Even if the course content on teaching literacy was absolutely top shelf, there is no way that's enough time to, pre for, to prepare primary teachers to do what is arguably their most essential job. So the Rowe Report um, Committee recommended that the key objective of primary teacher education courses to be to prepare student teachers to teach reading, and that the content of coursework in primary literacy education focus on contemporary understandings of evidence-based findings and an integrated approach to the teaching of reading, including instruction on how to teach phonemic awareness, phonics fluency, vocabulary knowledge, and text comprehension. The committee recommends that teaching literacy within subject areas be included in the coursework of secondary teachers so that they are well prepared to continue the literacy development of their students throughout secondary schooling in all areas of the curriculum. Sounds like a fair... In 2008, Ken Rowe had this to say about initial teacher education. Nothing has actually happened since the inquiry because higher education providers of teacher education and those who provide ongoing professional development of teachers, with a few exceptions, are still puddling around in postmodernist claptrap about how children learn to read. I will that quote out fairly often because it reminds me that if even Ken Rowe had difficulty getting ITE to improve, then it is a mammoth task indeed. Ten years later, Persistent, continued, widespread concerns about the preparation of teachers to teach reading were coming from three sources. Multiple reviews and inquiries into the quality of initial teacher education, such as the 2014 TMAG report. Research surveys of pre-service and graduate teacher knowledge about language and teaching and the perceptions of their readiness to teach reading. And testimonies from pre-service and graduate teachers. The short change report published in 2019 adds to the evidence supporting the need for urgent and dramatic improvement in initial teacher education by looking at the extent to which literacy units in undergraduate initial teacher education courses provide evidence-based information on how children learn to read and the most effective ways to teach them. It does this by examining the content of 116 literacy units in 66 degrees in 38 universities. So the report found that only 4% of literacy units had a specific focus on early reading instruction or early literacy. In 70% of the literacy units, none of the five essential elements or the five keys of effective evidence-based reading instructions were mentioned in the, in the outlines. In only 6% of courses, uh, all five were mentioned. None of the unit outlines contained any reference to the simple view of reading. The model or theory mentioned most often in the unit outlines was the four resources or four roles of a reader model, and that got eight mentions. The socio-cultural model or view of reading was referred to nine times. The report also looked at the qualifications and expertise of the lecturers and course coordinators responsible for them. For those units for which information could be found, a very small minority had specific expertise or research interest in early reading instruction or literacy. Almost a third had research interests and expertise outside of the literacy domain. 
So this suggests that expertise on the specific discipline of reading instruction, that is taking a child who cannot read and making them into a reader, uh, was very much lacking in university education faculties and the course content reflected this. As a second form of insight and perhaps an even more telling one, we looked at the prescribed reading lists for courses. The six most commonly prescribed textbooks were reviewed for their evidence-based content. They all endorsed non-evidence-based approaches to teaching reading, such as multi-queuing and the four resources model. All aspects of reading were covered with insufficient reference to the evidence base, with phonics being the most poorly represented. Analytic phonics was the favoured approach where phonics was there at all. As per a recommendation in the shortchanged report, the Federal Minister for Education, Dan Tian, instructed the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership to propose a set of amendments to the accreditation standards for ITE courses. AITSL conducted a follow-up review to verify the report's findings and convened a working party to come up with the following amendments. They were endorsed by all state and territory education ministers in December 2019 and, all, and were published in the standards in 2020. All providers of teaching degrees must meet these standards the next time they seek accreditation. AITSL also commissioned a set of excellent reports by the Macquarie University Centre for Reading and the Australian Council for Educational Research to provide detailed guidance on how to meet the new standards. So what has happened since then? A handful of universities are truly meeting the standards, most notably La Trobe University and the University of Queensland. Others have courses that would meet the standards, such as Lorraine Hammond's postgraduate courses at Edith Cowan University, but the powers that be with the institutions, within the institutions have decided not to bring them into the compulsory course content for the initial teacher education, at least at the undergraduate level. Where content outlines have changed and now include the words they're expected to include, the changes are superficial. They're still teaching ineffective instruction methods with some perfunctory and sometimes inaccurate inclusions of evidence-based instruction. There is a lot more to be done here and I can't help but wonder what Ken Rowe would have said. Last year, the then Federal Education Minister, Alan Tudge, instigated a review of initial teacher education that was tasked to evaluate the current state of ITE and whether the TMAG reforms introduced since 2014 had been effective and make recommendations for improvement. The report states, consultation with ITE graduates and employers of teachers nationwide revealed a consistent shared concern. Far too many graduates are leaving university underprepared to teach children how to read. Specifically, that many ITE graduates feel confused about how to approach reading instruction and are unaware of the reason they should use particular strategies over others. Practice informed by the, the belief that children primarily inquire, acquire reading skills through immersion and exposure to print, disadvantages many students, particularly those with reading difficulties, and contributes to widening ach achievement gaps. Experienced teachers are spending time developing underprepared early career teachers in evidence-based reading instruction. ITE graduates are more likely to reproduce practices they have been exposed to during their courses and while on practicum placements than look to bodies of research to, to inform their practice. The quality of preparation ITE graduates receive in the teaching of reading affects their employability. Among the review's recommendations were to strengthen the accreditation standards around the teaching of reading, reward high-performing institutions that deliver good performance through the use of evidence-based approaches to the teaching of reading, include a requirement for state and territory school systems to use evidence-based reading practices in the next national school reform agreement, and to connect the funding of ITE degrees to a quality measure that includes the provision of evidence-based instruction content. While universities typically call upon the principle of academic freedom, there is an argument that this has limits in a professional degree that has direct impact on the public. It's a pity that this sort of regulation is required and other mechanisms should also play a part, such as alternative provision and by the publication of indicators of course content that will allow pr prospective students to make informed choices. 
So that's a bit of a wrap up of policy and initial teacher education. So what are some other things that we can look to as sources of optimism and signs of progress? Given that there's such a big information gap left by ITE, we're fortunate to have so many knowledgeable people who are willing to generously fill this gap through a variety of different platforms. Many teachers and principals have turned to alternative sources of professional learning and information, including LDA, Ausbeld, Dyslexia Spelled Foundation, the other state spells, Five from Five, the short courses run by the Science of Language and Reading Lab, the Macquarie University Centre for Reading, the Fogarty Advanced Program, Teach Well, Knowledge Society and Primary Focus, CogLearn, Think Forward Educators, as well as groups like the Developmental Disorders of Language and Literacy or DDOL email group and the Reading Science in Schools Facebook group. A special mention also to the Dyslexia Support Groups and Code Read for the advice you give to schools and parents and your tireless advocacy. Program developers and publishers play an important role too. Many are represented here today, which demonstrates how engaged they are with the research and teaching communities. Evidence-informed published reading programs literally translate research into practice. Over the past few months, there's been an increased acknowledgement of the benefits of giving teachers access to well-designed lesson plans and resources to alleviate workload and lower the variability in quality of instruction. Published reading programs have been doing this for years in Australian schools with excellent outcomes for both teachers and students. Some other things that we can look to are the Tasmanian 100% Literacy Goal, which is still in an advisory stage, um, well after we thought it would be into action stage. There are communities of practice all over the country that promote evidence-based instruction. There are regular media reports on high-performing schools that draw attention to evidence-based teaching, and we're really uh, grateful and should acknowledge the role of um, our great journalists in um, bringing this to the public's attention. There's widespread uptake of evidence-based reading programs, decodable books are everywhere, and uptake of assessments like Dibbles and Arcadians that assess reading sub-skills uh, are becoming much more prevalent. All right, so after painting that fairly positive picture, what does the data say? This graph shows that according to the National Assessment Program for Literacy and Numeracy, there are some green shoots of progress. In every state and territory, there has been a statistically significant improvement in the mean reading scores in Year 3 and Year 5. So I haven't got Year 5 on the um, graph there, but um, it's definitely a significant shift um, in, since NAPLAN began in 2008. So the growth is particularly noticeable in the Northern Territory and has been for some time. The average is still much lower than other states, but the gap has narrowed. This graph also presents statistics from NAPLAN. This time it shows the proportion of students that are at or below the national minimum standard in Year 3 reading. So in 2008, um, we can see the proportion in blue. In 2021, we can see the proportion in orange. Fewer students were at or below the minimum standard in 2021 than in 2008. The change in Queensland is the greatest. That's partly explained by the addition of a year of full-time school in Queensland since NAPLAN started. Um, but I, I would speculate that there would still have been a, a drop, even if not quite so big. But despite this progress, here is a reminder of why we keep doing what we do and why we can't be complacent. Far too many students are still not learning to read after seven years at school, so at the end of primary. Around 57,000 students started high school last year with inadequate reading skills. But bear in mind that this doesn't include students who are absent or withdrawn from the test. The proportion of children who are barely reading at a minimum standard or below gets larger as they move through school. So that's the Matthew effect writ large. Governments like to point to the proportion of students just below the minimum standard, which is in the range of say six to 9%. However, it's well known that the minimum standard is a very low bar and the students who have only just reached it can't be considered to be reading at an adequate level. We need to be concerned about those students as well. Last month, the Productivity Commission released the interim report of its inquiry into the National School Reform Agreement. They're seeking to determine whether state and territory government policies, the regulations that bind them and the agencies that enact them have the right objectives and the right levers. One area of focus identified in the report is the objective of lifting outcomes for all students. 
An analysis of NAPLAN data that tracks students as they move through school in the report found that one, around one third of students who did not meet minimum literacy standards in year three did not meet minimum literacy standards again in year five. The graphic shown here is for numeracy. It shows that if we include students who are only at the minimum, uh, minimum standard, which as I've said, I think we should, because it's very low bar, 80% are still at or below the minimum standard in year five. They haven't produced a similar graphic for literacy uh, and the Productivity Commission wouldn't provide me with the data, but the report states that the pattern is similar for literacy and numeracy. So just to repeat, if we're talking about students at or below, uh, around 80% of students who are below the national minimum standard in year three are still at or below in year five. Our work is not yet done. A particularly interesting aspect of the Productivity Commission's report is that it acknowledges that most students who struggle with literacy and numeracy are not those who are part of what is termed a priority equity cohort. That is, they have not been identified as having social, economic, physical or cognitive characteristics that would impede them from learning to read. Some of these underperforming students will have an undiagnosed learning difficulty and the rest are almost certainly the instructional casualties that we are so acutely aware of, but that literacy policy has so often failed to recognise. Perhaps this is a turning point. I'm certainly going to try and make it one. A couple of years ago, Mandy Nathan, Lorraine Hammond and I developed this document to address exactly the problem highlighted in the Productivity Commission report. The primary reading pledge is a practical and a practical action plan for schools and systems to reduce the number of children who finish primary school unable to read. It provides an evidence-based framework for reading assessment and intervention that can be enacted without delay. So if the Productivity Commission is looking for a solution, we've already thought of it. Now, none of what has been achieved so far came easily. There was quite a lot of argy-bargy, petitions and counter-petitions, blog posts, opinion pieces, debates, defamation accusations, psychological and emotional injury, and some people who have chosen the path of the angels even damaged their careers in the process. So not, what do we need to do to keep those lines trending in the right direction? The research and teaching community knows a lot about how children learn to read and how best to teach them. Teachers and principals are often working in advance of and leading governments and most of our university education faculties. When I started developing the Five from Five project in 2015, it had three prongs. One was working with a coalition of like-minded people to get politician and policy makers on board. This has been relatively successful, although patchy. Being in a federated system of government has been a blessing and a curse. With a mix of state and federal funding and governance arrangements, there's no straightforward path to reform. A state-by-state -state approach has been required, but sometimes this can be helpful. For example, once South Australia demonstrated the value of the Year 1 phonics check, other states moved to adopt it. And there's no guarantee that a single central government will enable better policy more quickly. In England, this did happen, largely thanks to Nick Gibb. But the counterfactual is New Zealand, where literacy policy and, le and literacy levels are languishing despite the best efforts of some of our colleagues. Another prong of Five from Five was direct engagement with teachers and school leaders. Some outstanding early adopters of evidence-based practice like Blue Haven Public School and Marsden Road in New South Wales, Bentley West in Victoria and West Beach Row in Western Australia were willing to be cha champions for the cause despite going against the tide when all, with all of this discomfort that that brings. And now there are many schools, too many for me to list right now, doing amazing work. Many of the uh, teachers and leaders uh, are here with a list growing every day. These schools have been involved in peer-to-peer -peer professional learning and that movement is spreading quickly. The third prong was teacher education, which I left until last as part of the Five from Five project because I knew it would be the hardest nut to crack. Students in teaching degrees contact me often to tell me how poor the quality of their courses are. The online lectures I've seen are often appalling. Unless this changes, we can give up on the idea of ever achieving our goal. The teacher education expert panel convened by Federal Education Minister Jason Clare needs to think big on this. 
Government education departments and non-government authorities should stop trying to reinvent the wheel. There is far too much duplication of effort for no reason. The U1 phonics check is a great example. Millions of dollars and hours are being wasted creating a new and probably worse version of something that already exists. Similarly, there are many great resources available produced in the commercial and not-for-profit sectors that schools are already using with great success. Helping more schools to access and use them makes more sense. For decision makers outside of schools, don't just keep adding things to teachers' workloads. Replace the bad with the good, rather than keeping both with the objective of trying to keep everyone happy. Running records and decodable books are like oil and water. There's an urgent need to address low literacy and numeracy among adolescents who won't benefit from the long-term policy changes that I've talked about. There are some great people working on this issue, but it's not an easy fix. While our work with initial reading instruction is far from done, there are other things that need attention. Reading comprehension and writing in the upper years of primary are less well researched than initial instruction, but much is still known about how to develop these capacities. If we want to prepare students for secondary education, which we do, then this can't be neglected. And of course maths. The science of maths is becoming a thing, and you might have missed it, but a low-key maths war took place over the Australian curriculum. This is the next frontier, because if you think reading is bad, you'll be shocked about maths. So here we are, back in 2022. How positive can we be? You only have to look around at the people here today to feel optimistic. This audience spans two generations at least. You have come from far and wide, you've already achieved a lot, and I've no doubt that with persistence and sheer bloody-mindedness, we can achieve our common goal to get all children reading. Thank you.